Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to uh, this year's uh, SMU in Japan. I'm sorry, uh, this year's uh, uh, Sunstar Pro uh, um, SMU Tower Center, Sunstar Program, um, Sunstar Symposium uh, in Japan uh, 2018. Uh, at Tansei Dakrin University. Uh, I'm a director of the, uh, I'm Hiroki Takeuchi, I'm the director of the uh, Sunstar program on Japan and East Asia in the SMU uh, Tower Center. Um, Sunstar program uh, in the SMU Tower Center uh, is uh, uh, East Asia program um, that is uh, trying to develop uh, the studies of uh, Japan and East Asia uh, in the American South. And uh, as you may know, um, the American South has become um, more increasingly important uh, for uh, American politics and economy, uh, as well as the world uh, politics and economy. Um, our uh, name of the program, um, Sun Star Program, uh, Sun represents uh, Japan, and Star actually represents Texas. Uh, so uh, don't say that, don't call it the uh, Sun Stars. You know, star has to be singular because we are in Texas. Um, today, um, we are going to uh, host, uh, we are going to uh, organize uh, this uh, very timely uh, symposium. And uh, before starting, I would like to acknowledge um, a few uh, people. But uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, there are uh, st our staff members uh, who are uh, organizing uh, this uh, um, symposium and making this symposium uh, possible. So uh, directed, um, the staff directed by uh, the executive director of the Tower Center, uh, Luisa de Rosal. <laughs> and uh, um, our um, um, communication uh, coordinator, Kari Hansen. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have uh, uh, two more staff members who travel to uh, 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 Kansai and uh, uh, one of them, uh, Bora Razzi, who actually was the main force of the preparing for this symposium, uh, suddenly got sick today, uh, and then she couldn't come here uh, to help us. And uh, also another uh, staff member, financial coordinator, uh, financial manager, uh, Ray Rapidi, uh, is currently uh, in the uh, uh, hotel to uh, take care of um, uh, Bora. So um, uh, we were... Um, uh, so uh, we have uh, only two staff uh, members uh, from the uh, SMU side. Uh, also, uh, two uh, people uh, joined us uh, from the KGU, uh, and then Mr. Uh, Osamu Takao, Takao-san, uh, helping us. Thank you. And Yutaro Oda. So uh, if, you have any, you, if you need anything, um, please let them know. Um, so, uh, and then uh, we are very grateful uh, to work together uh, to make uh, this symposium uh, possible. I'd like to uh, also acknowledge a few uh, distinguished guests today. Uh, for, uh, from the, the current chancellor of Kansei Dakin, uh, Professor uh, Musubi Tabuchi. Also, we are honored to have the former chancellor uh, of the Kansei Dakin and the first, uh, uh, the first female chancellor um, of the Kansei Dakin, uh, Dr. Ruth Grubel. Um, later, we will, ha we will have a, a dean of the uh, speech from the dean of the School of International Studies of Kansei Dakin, uh, Dr. Hirabayashi. We are in the middle of the, we just started the uh, SME in Japan program, uh, which is actually um, not directly related to the Sunstar program, uh, but at the same time, uh, SMU and the KGU have uh, long, strong ties. And um, uh, so uh, this year, uh, we are uh, doing the third year of uh, um, SMU in Japan uh, Summer International Studies uh, Program. And then we have students here. So those are who are from the SMU, right, please stand up. Um, also, uh, so SMU students are coming, which means you know, some of the KGU students are going. So uh, um, Mr. Ryo Ogawa, who just came back uh, from SMU. He was a major force of the SMU basketball team uh, this year, uh, and uh, he studies, uh, uh, he's studying uh, uh, sports management, 
And uh, he's uh, the director of the SMU basketball team actually told me that uh, don't return Ryo to uh, KGU and then we should like, uh, let him like, graduate uh, from uh, SMU. Uh, so he, he contributed a lot um, to uh, SMU uh, basketball team. Also, uh, both uh, SMU in Japan program and also um, uh, this uh, the Sun Star program this time um, is uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Japan Airlines, and we have a, a representative from Japan Airlines, uh, Ms. Miyuki uh, Matsukubo. Matsukubo-san. <laughs> we are very grateful of the support of the Japan Airlines, uh, especially the Dallas office headed by uh, Mr. Hiroshi Abe. Um, okay, uh, and also, uh, SME in Japan program um, is not possible without the support help and effort of the, uh, Mr. Tani. So Tani-san, uh, he is the head of everything. So <laughs> SM in Japan program. So, um, I'm actually, um, I remember uh, fondly um, how uh, we started a uh, discussion of uh, uh, SME uh, re, uh, uh, reviving um, the ties between the KGU and SMU uh, four years ago. Uh, and then uh, thank you very much for your support and effort uh, for this program uh, possible. Now, uh, I would like to uh, in, um, introduce our uh, director, uh, on, so the director of the um, SMU Tower Center, uh, Dr. Jim Horfield, uh, my colleague, uh, my boss, and uh, my friend. I guess if I'm the boss, I get to stand on a much higher podium here. <laughs> well, it is such a delight for me personally to be back on the KGU campus. I had my, my first chance to visit uh, last year. Uh, I met a number of you then, especially Iguchi Sensei. I'm not sure where he is out there somewhere. But um, it was... Um, a real thrill to see this beautiful campus you have here. And uh, I have been to Japan quite a number of times over the years. Uh, those of you who know me uh, may have met my wife, who is somewhere here. She's not in the room at the moment, but I'm sure you will meet her before, the, uh, before this uh, conference is over. Uh, we've been married for over 40 years, so uh, I have a very strong, deep, personal tie uh, to Japan and have been here many times. But uh, I do want to echo uh, the remarks of uh, Takeuchi Sensei and thank our hosts here. Uh, I think I got your names correct, uh, Tabu Tabuchi Sensei, uh, Hirabashi Sensei, and uh, Iguchi Sensei. So thanks again to all of you for your, yes, let's give them another round of applause. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure, I think the relationship between KGU and SMU uh, goes back at least 50 years or 60 years. It's an... 1956, so this is a very old, very deep uh, historical relationship between two great universities. Um, and I have to pause just for a moment again and say as, uh, some, as the director of the center, someone who's been involved in building this program uh, for almost 20 years, uh, how deeply grateful I am to two of my colleagues who are here and uh, both of them, uh, one of them you know very well, who is Takayuchi Sensei, who uh, joined us in 2008 and when I was chairing the committee that hired him uh, I came across the file of a, a young scholar from uh, UCLA, uh, Berkeley, Stanford. I think he was actually teaching at Stanford uh, at the time. And I saw that he was an expert on China. And I said, oh my goodness, this is perfect. We have a scholar who works on China, but someone who can also lead a program on Japan. So we actually changed the name of the program to the Sun, from the Sun and Star program uh, on Japanese studies to the Sun and Star program on Japan and East Asia. 
And as Takeuchi is very proud of pointing out, it's the only East Asia program in the U.S. that <laughs> has Japan uh, in the lead. Uh, the other colleague that I do want you all to meet and to recognize her is Diana Newton, who is sitting right here on the front row. You're going to hear from her in a minute. And uh, I've worked with Takeuchi Sensei since 2008. Uh, I've worked with Newton Sensei uh, since uh, 2000, I believe, so almost 20 years. And she uh, came to help run and build this program. So the two of them really have made this, this program into one of the most outstanding programs on Japanese studies in the United States. Um, and I, I also, coming to Osaka, um, I don't know how many of you in the room have been to Dallas or Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, I think there's some, some similarity between these two places. I mean, Dallas-Fort Worth is, I call it the capital of North America, basically. It's the now, uh, I guess, fourth largest metropolitan area in the United States. It will soon pass Chicago to be the third largest. And what I say about Dallas-Fort Worth is it's just like Los Angeles, without the mountains, without the ocean, and without Hollywood. Uh, other than that, they're very similar. Uh, but it is like Osaka, it's in the heartland. You know, it's not Tokyo, it's not New York. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, synergy between a place like Osaka and a place like Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, and I'm just going to wind up by saying you're going to hear more from us soon about the U.S.-Japan relationship. You know, I was tempted to quote some famous writer who said, these are the times that try men's souls. I think that was, who said that? Was that Dickens? I think that was in one of his novels. But So uh, this is a very difficult moment. But I think the U.S.-Japan relationship is strong, just like the SMU-KGU um, relationship. And uh, finally, I want to say that I'm really pleased to see representative here from what we call the third estate, which is the, the press. My colleague and friend, uh, Kunesui uh, Sensei from the Asahi Shimbun. So watch out what you say here. It will may end up on the front page of the newspaper. So thank you very much. And um, I will now turn the podium uh, back over to, to Takeuchi Sensei. Thank you. Now we would like to have uh, uh, opening remarks uh, by uh, Professor Hirabayashi, uh, Dean of the School of International Studies of Kansei Gakuin University. I'm very sorry. Uh, I gave my greeting in Japanese uh, because I prepared uh, it, in, it for in Japanese. So, Kansei Gakuin uh, Hirabayashi to Hirabayashi. 本日は世界市民にしてキリストの使徒ワールドシティズンアンドクリスチャンパポステルスメニーランズというランバスを検証する言葉が刻まれています事実ランバスは南アメリカキューバアフリカヨーロッパシベリア中国朝鮮半島など世界を
創設母体が共通である歴史から教員の交流が図られ戦前戦後と多くの留学生を受け入れていただいています先ほど話題になっていましたけれども1979年に本学初の海外協定校となり今年ですでに40年の歩みを遂げようとしていますそのような両校が協力して本シンポジウムを開催することは本当に意義深いことと考えますとりわけ一昨日米朝会談を頂点に北東アジアの政治情勢経済情勢が大きく局面を変えようとしているタイミングで日米関係をしっかりと検証することは非常に時義にかなったことと考えますそのためにご尽力くださったタワーセンターの竹内先生にまず感謝をいたしますそしてまた基調講演者であるジェームス・ホルフィールド先生ダイアナ・ニュートン先生並びに明日になりますけれどもシンポジウムの各登壇者の皆さんに感謝をしたいと思います2日間にわたるプログラムでありますけれども両校にとってまた参加者すべての皆さんにとって有益な機会となりますよう期待しております会場校からの挨拶とさせていただきますありがとうございました Thank you very much, Hirabayashi Sensei.、Um, this, is, uh, uh, this symposium is、uh, co hosted uh, by the、uh, School of International Studies of、uh, KGU, and、uh, particularly、um, from the,、uh, the faculty of the International Studies, School of International Studies,、uh, Dr. Haro Iguchi h a v e made a tremendous effort to、uh, make this um, um, symposium possible. So please join me for、um, acknowledging、uh, Dr. Haruo Iguchi. <laughs> also,、um, SMU in Japan program.、Um, so、uh, today we have a, a person、uh, who went to、uh, SMU、uh, in 1980 as the first student. Of uh, uh, going to um,、uh, SMU from KGU as a, at that, that time an undergraduate student of KGU,、uh, Professor Naoya Hase. <laughs> Now,、um, I would like to,、uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, the first speaker、uh, of this symposium and also、uh, the first speaker、uh, of the keynote、uh, roundtable discussion.、Um, Again, my colleague,、uh, my boss, and my friend,、uh, Dr.、Uh, Jim Holyfield. And、uh, I would not uh, give an、uh, introduction, formal introduction of the speaker because you know, you, I think you have a、um, bio、uh, at your hand.、Uh, but before moving on,、uh, one thing that,、uh, about the,、um, uh, how to use the、uh, receiver of, for the translation、um, one thing I was told is、uh, don't touch like,、uh, um, grass.、Uh, And also,、uh, most importantly, perhaps, please、uh, either return it or leave it on the table after the symposium, after today.、Uh, don't bring it back home.、Um, あのレシーバーはあの終わりましたらあのいあの受付の方に返していただくかもしくはあのテーブルの上に置いておいてくださいあの後でスタッフで回収いたしますのであのくれぐれもあの持って帰らないようにしてください、okay. so now, um, please join me for welcoming、uh, Dr. Holyfield Well, I feel as if I should be speaking fluent Japanese、um, because I've been listening to it for most of my adult life. But、uh, it, one of my many failings,、uh, linguistically speaking, was, was never mastering Japanese.、Um, but you will see in a moment that、um, I do mix a little French into my presentation.、Uh, and I,、uh, the interpreters have already been alerted to this. And,、um, I wanted to start、um, these remarks、uh, with, a, I guess, a somewhat risque uh, uh, metaphor, uh, to use a French, uh, French term. 
um, looking back on the history of U.S.-Japan relations in particular, and I'm going to focus a bit more on the economic dimensions of this relationship. It's a very strong, long-standing economic relationship. Um, and I think my colleague, Professor Newton, will say a bit more about the security dimension of the relationship. But, you know, all of this will come out, I'm sure, in the discussion. But the, the risque comment with which I sort of in, entitled my talk uh, comes from a quote from one of my professors many years ago in the University of uh, in, uh, Sciences Po in Paris. And he was a very famous economist. He also was the prime minister of France. His name was Raymond Barre. And he was talking about the difficulties of economic relationships and trading relationships. And in negotiations, he said, it's often like uh, a relationship between to an old married couple where the one of the one of the couple says to the other chérie fais-moi peur which means darling scare me a little bit but you know that this is not really a threat you know it's go it's going to end well so you shouldn't be too worried about it and i think if you look at the history of especially us relationships with japan and europe it's very much like this, which is they're often harsh words are exchanged, uh, but it always ends up well. Um, so I think that what we're witnessing today is a very profound change in that relationship. Um, and if we look at this tactic in trade negotiations in particular between the U.S. and its allies... Uh, this has been a fairly common practice of threats and counter-threats, going back to the Bretton Woods period of the 1950s. Um, and I think we have been in a period of world politics and world history, which I would call uh, a, liberal, a liberal interregnum. So we've been in a very, very unusual liberal period in politics and history. Uh, another French term that characterizes this period from roughly the mid-1940s to the mid-1970s is the, the French call it the Tente Glorieuse. You know, this is 30 glorious years of economic growth, uh, relative peace and harmony, especially in the Western alliance. Uh, we had uh, a system of fixed exchange rates during this period, uh, and the new American president, still relatively new American president, Donald Trump, uh, he's right about one thing, I would say maybe only one thing, and that is that this system was rigged, to use one of his favorite terms. Uh, it was rigged in favor of Western Europe and Japan. Um, so we gave our allies uh, a sweetheart deal, uh, both in terms of exchange rates and in terms of the trade uh, relationship. But that was the essence <laughs> of U.S. leadership for decades. Uh, the United States, which was the most powerful country on the planet, we were willing to underwrite the costs of this liberal international order. We provided the public goods, whether it was stable exchange rates, sufficient liquidity, dollars in the system, uh, opening up our markets unilaterally, our powerful markets to uh, Japan and Europe. Um, and this is something that Donald Trump really doesn't like. He says the U.S. has been cheated, uh, that it has gotten a very bad deal. This policy, for those of you who know a little bit about post-war economic history, this policy began to shift in the 1950s and 60s uh, as first Europe recovered its economic uh, strength and then Japan. So in the late 50s and late 60s, the U.S. began to withdraw liquidity from the system. Uh, the exchange rates were renegotiated, uh, and our relationship evolved. Um, and... As you know, inevitably, the 30 glorious years, the 30 glorious came to an end. But with the weakening of the United States dollar, the rise of inflation, 
and the collapse of the Bretton Woods system itself in the early to mid-1970s. But, and this is a key point that scholars of this period make, uh, the institutions, the institutions that were put in place during the Bretton Woods period, I'm talking now about the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the International Monetary Fund, these institutions held in the 1970s, in the first great economic crisis. And the world did not slip back into uh, beggar thy neighbor policies. We did not go back to protectionism the way we saw in the 1920s and 1930s. So we got through this crisis in the 1970s. It tested the Western alliance and the relationship between Japan, the United States, and Europe. Uh, the other thing that made us stick together as an alliance was that we had a common enemy. <laughs> um, this was a bipolar international system. Uh, the USSR was clearly an enemy of the liberal West, uh, as was the People's Republic of China. Remember, China in the 1970s is going through the Cultural Revolution. Uh, the old saying in the height of the Cold War, we, ha we had met the enemy who was armed with nuclear weapons and extremely dangerous. So both in terms of the international system, the international economic order, the institutions uh, that had been created during Bretton Woods, the Western alliance held and it was strong in the 1970s. Uh, the 1980s, this changed decades, this was once again a test for the um, for the international economic order. But this time, it was not a collapsing dollar. It was not a weakened American economy. The American economy came back very strong during the Reagan era. Uh, but uh, we had another round of what I was saying at the beginning, which is, chéri, fais-moi peur. Uh, the US became very upset, very belligerent about the uh, trade relationship with Japan, Germany, and Europe. And uh, those of you who remember this, and I think Mr. Takeo is here somewhere in the audience in the back there, we were talking about the dispute over automobiles in the 1980s. Um, and uh, Ronald Reagan, the great free trading president, in any ways, many ways, Reagan was one of the most liberal economic leaders uh, in, in US history. Uh, he threatened the Japanese, forced them to accept voluntary restraint agreements, uh, appealing to this famous clause in the American uh, uh, trade law, Super 301, which says that if a country is deemed to be cheating in its economic relationship, the US president is required by law to retaliate against um, that country. And Japan was seen to be cheating economically, uh, exporting too many things, having a very favorable exchange rate. So Reagan said to the Japanese leaders at the time, if you don't help me and change your policy, then the Congress will force my hand uh, and I will have to retaliate against Japan. Uh, so there were fights with Japan during this period. There were fights with Germany over exchange rates, <clears throat> pushing Japan and Germany to revalue their, their currencies. But again, this was like the old married couple. Chéri, fais-moi peur. I'm going to threaten you. This sounds very bad, but it all ends well. Uh, and the Cold War, of course, was still raging. You had the missile crisis in Europe, the Soviet uh, invasion of Afghanistan, uh, and the Western Alliance and the Bretton Woods institutions remained strong during this period. Um, my wife, who is mysteriously absent right now, I'm not sure where she is, but uh, we were living in Boston, Massachusetts at the time. I was teaching at Brandeis University and working at Harvard and MIT. And uh, somewhere during that period, there was a sociologist at Harvard named Professor Ezra Vogel, some of you may have heard of him, uh, who wrote a book called Japan as Number One. And uh, I think he sold a couple of million copies of that book. And my wife turned to me one evening and she said, why don't you write a book like that? <laughs> That's a good book. Uh, and of course, Japan was seen as the number one competitor 
uh, of the United States and as a very big economic threat you know, to America and to the West. Um, but you know, we survived the Japanese threat. Japan was number one. Uh, it did not undermine uh, uh, the world order. It did not... I think the Japanese bought Rockefeller Center and a few other things, but uh, they made some good investments and some bad investments during that period. But nonetheless, uh, we survived uh, this, this competition with Japan. We would go on to pass a new uh, round of the GATT system, the Uruguay round, uh, which was, of course, the last multilateral trading round, successful uh, trading round. But something happened. Something changed very dramatically uh, in 1990, 1991. The enemy disappeared. <laughs> the Cold War ended. The Soviet Union collapsed. The Iron Curtain was lifted. Uh, and, of course, China itself was undergoing uh, an enormous transformation. In spite of the Tiananmen massacre, uh, China would go on to open up its economy, to liberalize, and eventually, as you know, to join uh, what became the World Trade Organization. Japan, which had been such a powerful country and seen as a threat, uh, would go into an economic crisis, uh, the so-called lost decade or lost decades. And one could argue Japan never has really recovered from the enormous economic bubble that had occurred in the 1980s and early 90s. Um, so the rationale, this is my point, for the United States to underwrite what we call the liberal international order, this rationale came under increasing pressure. Uh, we had a very clever president in the 1990s uh, who was a very good at selling this liberal order. I'm speaking, of course, of Bill Clinton. Uh, not only did we get through and pass the Uruguay round on his watch, we also passed something called the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, another center we have at SMU is a center focused on Texas and Mexico, which we just created uh, a year or so ago, and my colleague, Luis de Rosal, who is here, is the director of that. And as you know, NAFTA is also under enormous pressure right now. So everything shifted. Everything changed in the 1990s, and especially in the 2000s. We had rapidly changing comparative advantage. Uh, the IT revolution, the technological revolution, uh, which, of course, strengthened the service industries, uh, this was the decline of the old industrial uh, economies, uh, the famous second unbundling that Hiroki is so fond of uh, with the rise of com complex global supply chains. Uh, but most importantly, the domestic political consensus in the United States, the domestic consensus for the liberal order in the absence of a, of a common enemy, uh, began to unravel. Uh, this was the end of the what I call the, in the, the strange bedfellow political coalitions, the coalitions of left-wing Democrats, civil rights, liberal Democrats, politically liberal Democrats, and right-wing Republicans, the so-called Wall Street Republicans. This was the consensus that had held in the United States until the 1990s, and this consensus uh, actually collapsed. And the, the consensus would come under stress, under fire, uh, in three different areas. Uh, and George W. Bush, you know, he, he imposed steel tariffs at the beginning of his administration, you know, in order to get the votes of the industrial workers in the Midwest. Uh, so he fell victim to this, but he would return pretty quickly to his free trade uh, policies, resisting beggar thy neighbor protectionist policies. Um, and as we know, George W. Bush was not an isolationist. <laughs> you know, he would wage war. He was in many ways a very Wilsonian uh, interventionist. Uh, and George W. Bush certainly was not a nativist. He was very, very pro-immigration. So the liberal consensus held, you know, throughout the Bush years. But then came the Great Recession and the financial collapse of 2007, 2008. Um, Japan, I think, just to pause for a minute, was in actually in a stronger position, oddly enough, to deal with the financial collapse. 
uh, because Japan had already gone through an enormous financial crisis, and it was better prepared, I think, in some ways to cope with the Great Recession, both politically and economically. Japan was embedded in the most dynamic economic region on the planet in East Asia, and of course Japan was still a big player, a big investor in the U.S. market. But who had to to deal with this mess, who had to clean up this mess, uh, it was Barack Obama. Uh, and whatever you want to say about Obama, he stepped up and came up with some policies that helped to stabilize uh, the American economy. And he was committed politically to maintaining uh, the liberal international order. However, uh, Obama was pretty weak uh, on trade. He was not uh, very much of a free trader. And uh, I think he succumbed to some of the uh, protectionist tendencies within his own party. And he did not try very hard, like Bill Clinton had, to sell this liberal international order to U.S. voters because there was simply no political coalition there to build anymore. Um, during this period, we are witnessing, especially in Europe, the rise of populism. Uh, and the unleashing, I want you to remember this term, and I'm sure the interpreters will, uh, will translate it well. We have now unleashed the, what I would call the virus of nationalism uh, into world politics. It is back, and with a vengeance. And with this nationalism comes racism uh, and nativism. Uh, so the combination of the economic crisis, the Great Recession, the IT revolution, the decline of the industrial economies in Europe and the U.S., together with shifts in the international system, brought essentially a collapse of the domestic political consensus, uh, the strange bedfellow coalitions. Uh, my colleague, Professor Wilson, who's here, may talk more about this whole issue of nativism and isolationism and nationalism. Uh, in Europe, the, uh, this had been going on for a long time. Populist nationalist politicians attacking the liberal order, especially targeting Europe, the European Union. Uh, Brexit is one of the consequences of this, where politicians were constantly vilifying Europe, that it's Europe that's causing all of our problems. So not surprisingly, people turn against Europe. This happened in, uh, in Britain. Uh, but the real breakthrough of this new populism and this new Latin nationalism uh, would come not in Europe, ironically, but in the United States of all places with the election of Donald Trump. And Donald Trump's policies are built on three, on three stools, three legs of the stool. Uh, he is a mercantilist. I mean, he's very clear about this going all the way back to the beginning of his political business career. Uh, he sees the world in transactional business terms, and everything for him is a zero-sum game. You either are a winner or a loser. Uh, he is also a nativist. Uh, this is, he's been very consistent on this. He wants to shut down immigration to the United States. Uh, and at least in rhetorically, he was, has been something of an isolationist. And we will see whether that holds true with the Korea negotiations, um, I think he is quite happy to withdraw American troops from, uh, uh, from East Asia if the opportunity presents itself because, as he said, this is very expensive. He doesn't see the point in having these troops here, uh, and he's already taken a first tentative step in that direction by uh, canceling the joint military exercises uh, with South Korea. Uh, and, of course, we know this is very troubling for Japan and our allies in East Asia. So Trump is taking us, and again, remember the virus of nationalism. He's taking us, and have you seen this film before, back to the future. So we're going back to what America was like in the 1920s. I mean, it's not as if we haven't seen these policies before. I used a French term here. I apologize again for the French, although Kounesoué son and I are two of the French speakers in here. C'est l'Amérique, l'Amérique dans ses vieux souliers. Uh, like France, la France dans ses vieux souliers, you know, going back to our old ways, our old habits. Donald Trump succeeded in doing this through uh, brilliant demagogic tactics. Uh, he's built a strong political base using appeals to nationalism and nativism, attacking the liberal elite, arguing that liberals have sold out America, 
abandoning the real Americans in the name of free trade and open borders. Um, and he also, you recall, attacked our military interventions in Iraq and elsewhere. So where, where does this leave us? I'm going to conclude on these notes. We can see the consequences of this for international politics. And what an irony that the two powers that are now left to defend the liberal international order are none other than Japan and Germany. <laughs> in their respective regions. The question is, can Germany and Japan provide the kind of leadership that will be necessary to sustain this international order uh, as America abdicates its responsibilities, uh, abandons its leadership position, and Trump, as you know, is working actively to undermine this liberal order. Uh, if you compare Germany and Japan, uh, the Bundeskanzler the Chancellor of Germany, uh, Angela Merkel, is in perhaps a more difficult position than Prime Minister Abe uh, because she has to deal with a surge in populism and nationalism in her own country. If you look in the headlines, you will see a lot about this, much of it anti-immigrant populism, although Germany has yet to embrace nationalism for obvious reasons. The Germans are allergic to this virus of nationalism and have built up many antibodies and resistance to nationalism because of what happened in their history in the 19th and 20th century. So no new German nationalism yet, anyway. Uh, in Japan, and again, we can open this for discussion, you know, Japan, it's interesting to me that we have not seen a populist uh, insurgency in Japan. There is a new Japanese nationalism, and I would like to, you to talk with me more about this uh, and Prime Minister Abe's embracing of a more assertive uh, uh, position for Japan. Um, just as Germany has remained committed to European integration with the help of the French, I might add, Japan has taken up the mantle of TPP in leading to protect the liberal order that is emerging in East Asia. But larger geopolitical forces are at work, undermining this liberal order. Uh, and you could ask yourself the question, for those of you who study international relations in here, are we, are we returning to a 19th century style great power politics? Uh, that is a different political order, a different kind of political system, which requires a constant balancing. You don't have the institutions. And of course, that is an order that proved very unstable, leading us to uh, two world wars in the 20th century. Uh, will the Bretton Woods system collapse? Will the institution collapse? Uh, maybe. Uh, but everything depends on what's going to happen in the United States. Uh, is Trump an anomaly? Uh, will this new la nationalism be a long-term trend? I'm sure my colleague Professor Wilson will have an answer for that when he gets to the podium, or maybe Professor Newton will have an answer. Um, I being a good committed liberal myself, as you can see, uh, I don't think this will last. Uh, and you know, I have a very simple hypothesis, and we may test this in the, in the fall elections, and I think you will see a generational shift in the US. I don't, most of the Trump supporters are older. Uh, they are um, predominantly white, and they are uh, not all that well educated. So I think much will depend on the younger generation. Uh, I don't think the generation of my children or my grandchildren, I'm about to have my first grandchild in September, uh, they, I don't think this generation will embrace uh, a closed society, uh, a nativist and a racist society, and an intolerant society. Um, but one thing is for sure, uh, the expression uh, Chéri fait moi peur, no longer holds. <laughs> uh, the threats now are deadly serious. They are deadly serious. And they will not end, this will not end happily uh, for any of the old married couples, whether it's U.S. Japan, U.S. Europe, or as we can see, U.S. Canada. So on that happy note, uh, I will conclude. Thank you. I'm delighted to um, introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much for uh, 
Um, well, I try to write, uh, uh, be optimistic, so. <laughs> um, uh, I'm to, uh, delighted to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Diana Newton, uh, my colleague, and also my uh, predecessor of the director of the uh, SANSTAR program. Uh, when she was directing, she, uh, it was the SANSTAR program uh, in Japanese studies. And uh, I still remember, like, 10 years ago, I joined the SMU faculty, and then basically I joined her of um, um, Japanese studies of SMU, uh, which means at that time, only she was uh, working on Japan and uh, working on East Asia uh, from social sciences. And uh, now we have four faculty members uh, working on Japanese social sciences. Uh, thanks to the support from the Japan Foundation, uh, we received a big grant um, a few years ago. Um, and then uh, we changed the name into a Sun Star program on Japan and East Asia. And we have to keep Japan uh, in the name. And then, as Jim said, uh, this, is an, uh, um, this is the only East Asia program in the nation that has Japan before uh, East Asia. Um, and then I uh, think the Japan Foundation is uh, happy about it. Uh, this, uh, this symposium also is uh, uh, supported uh, by generous support uh, from uh, Japan Foundation. Uh, we are very grateful. Uh, unfortunately, they told us that uh, they couldn't send people uh, from Tokyo. Uh, so, but uh, they said uh, uh, they sent uh, best uh, regards um, for our uh, symposium. Uh, but uh, uh, without further delay, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Diana Newton. Thank you, Hiroki, for that introduction. Thank you for organizing this entire event. And thank you, Jim, uh, for your remarks. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be any more optimistic than Jim is, but, but maybe I am a little bit, um, because I'm really going to focus on the US-Japan relationship specifically. Um, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, as you all know, recently tried to bridge the gap between the United States and the G7 countries which put him in a complicated situation in a conference room in Canada last week. He refrained from criticizing President Trump on trade, and he encouraged the other nations in the room um, in Canada to support Trump as he faced negotiations with North Korea. Um, but he was not rewarded with a willing partner in Trump. Um, Trump's childish decision to lash out at Trudeau and renege on an agreement that he had hours earlier decided to support left Abe in a lonely balancing act. Um, but I don't think Prime Minister Abe's efforts have been for naught. He is one of the most important allies that the United States has at this time, even if it is a thankless role. Um, over its 70 plus year life, the US-Japan relationship has occasionally been, um, as Kenneth Pyle said, an unpleasant reality. Um, the alliance came with positives and negatives for Japan, certainly. The integral U.S. presence in Japanese foreign policy has been sometimes annoying, overbearing, um, occasionally belittling, but it has always been reliable, and uh, the U.S. has always had Japan's back. In the global arena early on, the U.S.-Japan alliance assured the United States that Japan would be on the U.S. side during the Cold War. And as it progressed, the alliance kept Japan in sync with U.S. global strategy. Um, domestically, while it could be uncomfortable at times, the U.S. alliance actually freed up a post-war Japan to pursue economic growth to its huge advantage, leaving the United States in charge of its foreign policy and defense policy. <clears throat> Thus, the unpleasant reality of the U.S. involvement in Japan's post-war growth and development became first the status quo and then a true partnership with benefits for both nations. Um, Japan and the United States worked together to promote benefits that accrued to both nations, such as security, economics, global initiatives. And now it looks like, after all of these years of working together and working so well together, the U.S. President, the current U.S. President, is quickly trying to return the relationship to an unpleasant reality. Um, Japan was perhaps a bit underwhelmed by the slow and steady approach of the no drama Obama administration. Um, the previous U.S. President's refusal to consider military options really effectively took that tool off the table. And 
in the realm of the Pacific with a rising and aggressive China and a newly nuclear and aggressive North Korea, um, I would argue that military action would be a foreign policy tool we would want to keep on the table. Obama's decision not to back up his infamous red line for chemical weapons use in Syria with military action understandably worried his allies, especially those tied to him through security alliances, like many of the nations in Asia. Um, and it delighted his adversaries just a little, or at least made them feel a little bit bolder. Um, Obama would argue his legacy in Asia a bit differently, I think. He would point to the pivot to Asia as a um, jewel in the Obama Asia policy crown, but he was never really able to breathe life into the pivot to Asia. Um, due to lack of time and resources, um, the United States engagement in the Middle East continued to take up a lot of time and and um, become and, and tended to be something that needed attention right away. Um, and then he also was unable to breathe life into the pivot to Asia because of a lack of need. Um, the status quo was working in Asia. It was mostly peaceful. Things were going well. I think Obama, President Obama, would also point to the TPP, on which he expended significant resources and time and personnel, but to no avail. Even Obama's former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, ditched the agreement during her campaign as the other two candidates, major candidates, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, had already repudiated it. Although this ended up being a move that the American public mostly supported, it was a mistake, in my opinion. Although President Trump has said thus far um, that he might reconsider this decision, um, it seems thus far that his statement is mostly empty words, and, and we haven't really seen any action to that, to that avail, even though Prime Minister Abe has been trying to hold him to that comment. Um, regardless, in the wake of an overly broad articulation of U.S. foreign policy in Asia under the Obama administration, um, sort of an over-promising but under-delivering um, foreign policy towards Asia with the pivot to Asia, President Trump has arrived to take President Obama's place, and President Trump is keenly interested in doing less in Asia, and I think we've seen that. And in this um, strange mix of tumultuous times um, internationally and domestically, Jim spoke eloquently to what's going on worldwide, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, I would argue, has stepped up and has stepped in, much as he did at the G7 last week. Um, and has been doing since the Trump presidency began. Um, while it's not all altruistic, um, certainly, he has, he's interested in um, really connecting with the United States and holding the U.S. alliance together. Um, he's worked really, really hard, and I, I think he deserves some credit for that. Um, while he is scandal-ridden at home here a, a little bit, um, I think he deserves a lot of kudos for how he's tried to manage the U.S.-Japan bilateral relationship. Um, he jumped into this bubbling cauldron with both feet, and he did so quickly. Um, he boasts the first head of state visit to President Trump uh, right after the election. He boasts the first golf game with President Trump at Mar-a-Lago. I think he actually also boasts the second golf game with President Trump at Mar-a-Lago. Um, and he's definitely the head of state that has had the most conversations and connections with the president. He has talked to him on the phone, probably over 40 times. He has met with him multiple times. Before every significant event that affects Japan, he has come to Washington to meet with the president. Um, and the fact that the president is, is welcoming him is significant. Um, I, I would say he has done more than any other global leader over the past 17 months of the Trump administration to support a global economic order under stress and to shape U.S strategy in the Pacific. Um, at a time when the institutions, rules, and norms of the liberal economic order are under dis duress from challengers like China, as well as nativism at home, the world's first and third largest economies should be working together to pursue, an, uh, sorry, to update and uphold an economic system and a, and a security system that has provided so much benefit to each of them and to the globe over the past 70 years. Yet the United States under President Trump seems to have been working to uh, royal the liberal international order 
that the United States built and once championed. Um, Japan, under Abe, however, has done more to fill the leadership vacuum left by a distracted, disinterested, and at times disruptive United States. Um, for example, take the TPP. While Trump took care to tear up the agreement during his first week in office, Abe has led the other 11 parties to the agreement to create the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. While Australia, Singapore, and others deserve credit for getting the 11 nations across the finish line to a signed CPTPP in Chile in March, it might not have happened without Abe's immediate leadership. He also convinced the other nations to suspend rather than revoke the 22 items of interest to the United States, making it possible for the U.S. to return to the agreement at some point in the future. Japan also took the lead in creating a coalition of the willing, if you will, to take on problematic trade practices by China. Over some resistance from the European Commission, Tokyo brokered a trilateral, trilateral agreement with the European Union and the United States on the margins of a World Trade Organization meeting in Argentina in December of 2017, calling for collaboration to push back against policies, implicitly China's, that produce excess capacity or impose forced technology transfer and local content requirements on foreign businesses. Japan also joined the EU and the US in April in filing a joint case at the WTO against China's forced technology transfer policies. In addition, Abe has led an initiative called Partnership for Quality Infrastructure, which is a not too subtle counterpoint to China's One Belt, One Road initiative. Abe committed $110 billion to finance the building of roads, railways, and ports around Asia in May of 2015, and since then the amount has gone up to $200 billion and become global in its geographic scope. Uh, Trump echoed this effort in his Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum speech in Vietnam in November of last year, although less subtly. He declared, uh, Trump declared, that America intended to push back against predatory policies and economic aggression using the promotion of high-quality infrastructure investment tools via the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and the U.S. Development, um, U.S. Finance Development. In addition to regional and international leadership on trade and infrastructure, Japan has also been instrumental in shaping the Trump administration's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Prime Minister Abe was the first to use this term in his own remarks in, the, in August of 2016, but former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson used the phrase in his first major speech in October of 2017, and President Trump again echoed that phrase in his APEC speech in Vietnam in November of last year. And it is not an accident that the officials from the Japanese National Security Council and the U.S. National Security Council of the United States and Japan have been closely coordinating their efforts to shape strategy in the region and to push back against Chinese assertiveness in the maritime realm. Um, it is clear that Trump and Abe share the view that China is a strategic competitor. And I believe Trump should be doing more to work with Abe and Japan on this issue. Likewise, Trump should be championing Japan's views on North Korea as his administration begins a new phase in that bilateral relationship. Um, Abe's two goals on that front, as you are well aware, is the elimination of all missiles that could reach Japan and not just um, intercontinental ballistic missiles that could reach the United States, and of course the return of the Japanese abductees. Uh, it's too soon to tell whether or not the U.S. president um, has taken its number one ally's interest into account in a forceful and meaningful way in the conference room in Singapore on Tuesday, uh, but the promise to cease all military exercises with South Korea may not be such a great sign, uh, so we'll have, to, we'll have to see. But the question, the real question, I think the real crux is whether or not enduring repeated um, slaps and surprises from Trump is really worth it for Abe and for Japan. Um, again, like North Korea, the North Korean negotiations, I think it is too soon to tell. Um, and it's possible that there will be domestic political repercussions to Abe for standing by an ally who will not give you exemptions on steel tariffs while handing them out to others. But um, with, as we say in, in English, um, with friends like that who needs enemies, right? 
Um, but I hope that Abe can stand the heat enough to stay in Trump's kitchen. <laughs> Uh, Abe's efforts have not been in vain. Um, he and his admin administration have affected U.S. policy decisions, and that is a good thing. He is able to reach the president and talk to the president frequently. One never knows when and how that will be helpful, but it has to be a positive with a president who seems to be um, deeply affected by the last person with whom he spoke. Um, perhaps most importantly, those working in both governments below the head of state level are working together and have invested significant efforts to promote the shared interests of both countries, and this has resulted in tangible policy initiatives and advances. Despite Japan's understandable frustration with, the, with Trump's unreliable, excuse me, unreliability and unpredictability, the U.S.-Japan relationship is a necessity for both nations. Looking at the long game, Japan and the United States benefit from working together. The continued U.S.-Japan alliance is a necessity to thwart China in its efforts to reduce or remove U.S. influence and presence from the region, while simultaneously expecting Japan to acknowledge China's supremacy. The joint defense network that Japan and the United States have built over the past 70 years is significant. And while the U.S. president may not fully appreciate it, I think that many in the U.S. government working on defense policy do. Japan is America's most important defense ally, and due to the duration of the relationship, it functions very well. For example, the Yokosuka Naval Base is a joint facility with permanent skilled workforce who maintain and repair both U.S. ships and Japanese ships, and this is just one manifestation of our strategic alliance that is based on strongly shared operations, trust, understanding, and thus power. The United States military realizes how fortunate it is to have this kind of joint basing arrangement, especially after almost 20 years of precarious, insecure relationships and joint basing efforts throughout the Middle East. President Trump will probably never recognize or understand the U.S.-Japan alliance in a way that fully appreciates Japan or even the loyalty that Prime Minister Ha'abe has recently expressed uh, and extended to the president. However, the United States can only hope that Shinzo Abe has a thicker skin than our own president and that he is doing all this work not to be liked, but to advance the policy interests of his country and his people the American people are definitely going to be beneficiaries of this goodwill as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now uh, we are moving to the uh, roundtable discussion. And uh, I think like uh, the staff of the uh, Translator Twin Titan uh, will uh, move the um, table and then the put the chairs and then also the roundtable. Um, it's... Uh, At the same time, uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, my colleagues, um, Jim and Diana, uh, on the uh, podium, and uh, we will do the um, roundtable discussion. We have a round table. <laughs> um, well, it was interesting that the Jim started uh, with uh, uh, talking about history and uh, historical development of the um, kind of liberal international order. Um, and then uh, Trump is going back, trying to go bring it bring back to uh, uh, back to the 1920s. Um, I still remember um, when Trump was elected uh, in November 2016, and uh, end of that month, I think that during the Thanksgiving holiday, I visited uh, KGU to talk about the uh, following year's uh, program. 
And um, I met with uh, um, my uh, friend and uh, fellow uh, China specialist, uh, Miyake Sensei, uh, in the office. And then we are talking about, you know, both are, uh, we both are uh, China specialists. So, uh, well, so it seems that the U.S. is stepping down from leading international order. And then I kind of, who is the next? And then many people saying China. But we all know about you know, China, how busy China is uh, for handling uh, domestic politics. So, uh, well, I don't think that we don't think that uh, we didn't think that China could like uh, lead um, international uh, order. And then what? And then, like you know, U.S. is the largest economy in the world. China is the second largest economy. And what is the third largest economy? And then that is actually Japan. And then fourth largest economy, Germany. <laughs> Um, so uh, we were saying that, uh, um, well, it's a, uh, well, we, we are saying, uh, speaking in Japanese, we are saying that, uh, <laughs> that is, uh, which means, um, um, well, um, it's a very um, interesting age. Um, Japan and Germany are expected uh, to lead international order. Uh, and then Japan, of course, is notorious, historically, about uh, a lack of intention um, it's, a, it's a different issue whether Japan is able to lead, but uh, Japan always lacks intention uh, of a lead, uh, leading uh, international order. Um, so um, my question always uh, is uh, um, um, who will uh, lead international order, uh, leading uh, liberal international order? Uh, and then liberal international order is basically about free trade and democracy. Uh, and then I'm not, I'm, I, um, I don't think that you know, Japan is in a good position to lead the um, dem uh, democracy or the spread of democracy. Uh, but I think that Japan is in a good position uh, to lead the free trade. And the uh, recent Japanese effort of uh, um, concluding the CPTPP, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, that is actually a very good uh, sign that you know, Japan, for the first time in history, I would say, uh, concluded, uh, took an initiative to conclude the um, free trade agreement, a big free trade agreement, which U.S. does not uh, participate in. So, uh, so that's actually a very uh, interesting move, and uh, that's a positive sign, I think. But I still have a question of like, who, who leads the um, international, liberal international order? Um, so uh, any, uh, Jim, start, you, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I think it was a former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, remember her? She wrote a book called The Indispensable Nation. And she was talking, of course, about the United States. Um, you know, when I, it's been a while since I taught basic introduction to international relations, but I know there may be some in this room who've had to do that. And I often remind the students that, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. So, if you have an abdication of a leadership, a power vacuum, uh, eventually some country will fill that, that vacuum, that role. Uh, it might not happen right away, uh, but it, it will eventually. And um, I agree with my colleague Takeuchi Sensei. I, I don't think China you know, is ready to do this even with the One Belt, One Road initiative, as they call it. Uh, China clearly is flexing its muscles. It would like very much to get the United States out of its neighborhood to be able to control the, this region. And uh, that includes uh, you know, having Japan step back. Uh, and China would very much, I think, like to see the weakening of, of uh, U.S. alliances in East Asia, no question about that. But is China going to be a global power? If you look at renminbi, you know it is the the Chinese currency is still not a global currency. Um, it is um, uh, not really a tradable currency. Uh, the U.S. you know still has. Uh, what the former French president Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, uh, who was the creator, by the way, of the G7 uh, club, uh, he called it exorbitant privilege. You know, the U.S. has the world's international currency. We still do. Now, Trump may succeed in destroying that too. I don't know. He's he's certainly going to give it a try. 
but for the moment, the U.S. is still the predominant economic power. Um, you know, and Trump is moving to uh, undermine, you know, uh, the U.S. leadership position. There's just no question about that. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, uh, what exactly he has in mind, um, having the U.S. be uh, essentially a lone power, returning to um, what is essentially a unilateralist position. Uh, he does pay attention to bilateral relationships, but he certainly has no interest whatsoever in uh, multilateralism. Uh, so um, we are going into a period of incredible uncertainty, I think, right now in world politics. Will Germany be able to fill that void? I don't know if you listen to the German chancellor, she seems to be running away from this as fast as she can. Uh, I sent a message to ger German friends after Trump's election, and I said, well, we, she's now the f leader of the free world, essentially. And, of course, the next day she announced that I am absolutely not the leader of the free world. Germany has no intention of playing that role. Uh, she still is very, very committed to Europe, obviously, and she wants to see the EU uh, take a stronger position. And I think her, what was the famous quote she said, looks like, we can no longer count on the United States to provide the kind of security and uh, protection that we saw in the past, uh, and that Germany will have to assume a greater responsibility. But for her, this means Europe assuming a greater responsibility. Um, and she does like Europe. She wants more Europe, but not if it's going to cost Germany too much economically. We know she's very, very cautious about that. Um, yeah, which brings us back to Japan, you know, and I'd be curious to know what other people in the room think. Is Japan in a position to provide not only economic leadership, which Japan has always provided uh, economic leadership, but real political leadership? Um, and I must say, you know, the negotiations over Korea don't give me too much hope, you know. All those great golf games and phone calls, <laughs> got it. Prime Minister Abe, absolutely nothing. He was simply pushed aside, ignored. Uh, and of course, China, I think China has played a much bigger role behind the scenes in all this than, than we can imagine. And of course, the South Koreans deserve enormous credit for heading off what could have been a nuclear exchange on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and flattering President Trump and getting him to a table with Kim Jong-un. So that's my, my thoughts about the leadership question. I just want to say whether we go back to a, a period of great power politics, that, uh, that is unclear to me. Uh, still, I think the jury is out as to whether we return to a 19th century uh, kind of great power politics. Well, I <laughs> never like to predict the future, so um, I, I hesitate. And Jim, you know, has has expounded on this carefully. But I would just add that I I think what we would like for it very much to be someone in the U EU, but I think that's highly unlikely because I think they're really struggling with their own nationalism as well. <clears throat> I actually think Germany is struggling with that. There was a comment this week from the alternative party in Germany that na Nazism was just a speck on a thousand-year great history of Germans. So I do think there's issues in Germany and Italy, in France, I mean, the, everywhere, and England with Brexit. So I, I, But I think it will be some kind of coalition. I don't think it's going to be... Um, I mean, I, let me step back. To Jim's point, I think the United States is still leading for a little while, even though we're leading poorly and we're leading erratically. Um, we're, we're the biggest power and we still have the biggest economy and as a result we're going to play an outsized role. Um, but I would say that there's probably going to be some kind of alliance that would come up that would include Japan. I think India is a country to look to. Um, they have a large democracy, they have a long way to go, but I think they have a lot to contribute um, in terms of security. They're finally interested in having military 
um, alliances and security alliances. So I think that's an interesting country to watch. I think the EU is no question going to have a role in promoting democracy and liberal institutions, but um, I think it's, it's very difficult to guess who that will be. Well, um, I have uh, so many questions um, following that, but uh, I would like to uh, say, uh, I'd like to ask uh, one more question before opening to the floor. Uh, and then, by the way, uh, we, are we are doing a little bit overtime as uh, we started a, a little bit late. Um, but uh, it's a North Korean issue. Uh, some interesting meeting happened uh, a few days ago, and uh, it's on the June 12th. And uh, on that day, I think both, uh, both Jim and Diana and then other uh, my uh, colleagues uh, were flying uh, from the Dallas to uh, Japan, Tokyo. And, uh, you know, one thing that I was uh, sure was... Uh, there will be no uh, missile launch uh, during the meeting, <laughs> so uh, that will be safe. Um, well, so, um, you know, it's too early to say uh, about uh, the implications of the meeting, and particularly this meeting. Um, so uh, two weeks ago, um, we had in an SMU campus, um, uh, hosted by uh, George W. Bush Institute, uh, which actually uh, is located in SMU campus. Uh, George W. Bush Institute hosted a talk about North Korea, and then one of the speakers was uh, uh, Vittu Cha, uh, who is a prominent Korea specialist, uh, who was uh, um, to be nominated, almost to be nominated, uh, for amb U.S. ambassador to um, South Korea, and then later uh, he was withdrawn, uh, I think, and he was uh, uh, too reasonable uh, to become an ambassador of the uh, you know, Trump administration. Um, so... Uh, Victor Cha uh, said uh, uh, one thing that he uh, evaluates uh, positively uh, the uh, Trump uh, Kim Jong Un meeting is actually uh, if it's not uh, uh, Trump, no U.S. president would have met with uh, Kim Jong Un. Um, his uh, former boss uh, George W. Bush uh, simply didn't like uh, Kim Jong Un, so uh, he would not have met. I was at that time Kim Jong Il. So he would not have met the uh, um, North Korean leader. Um, but Donald Trump um, uh, agreed with uh, meeting with him. Um, so uh, but at the same time, uh, this uh, uh, meeting was unique because uh, he said that usually about like 90 to 99 percent of the agreement is already made when leaders meet. But this time, approximately only 10 percent was made uh, or was agreed uh, before the meeting. So, um, so that's actually the, so, um, a lot of improvision. So, um, so we don't know what will happen, but um, could you talk a little bit about the implication of the um, Trump uh, Kim Jong Un meeting and uh, starting with Diana? Sure. It's an anomaly for sure, and it is hard to tell what the true implications are going to be because it doesn't seem that it was a hastily conceived summit and it was a hastily concluded summit and uh, to Victor's point oftentimes summits like this the preparation is almost a year long before um, a head of state would go into a summit and the deliverables are all agreed to and already in the communique that's been reviewed multiple times by multiple sides of the government. Um, in this case that was not what happened. Um, and we know um, very little about what the two men actually said to one another. Um, not much of that has been reported out. The communique that was released or the words that we've seen from it um, don't say everything that we thought that the Trump administration was going to insist on. Um, the complete and verifiable denuclearization, uh, irreversible, complete and um, verifiable denuclearization of the peninsula. So. Um, it really does seem like it was in large part mostly a photo op, and, and I do think that a lot of the um, serious elements, the substance of it, is going to come out in whatever um, Secretary Pompeo's talks end up being with his North Korean counterparts. So I think it's a little bit too soon to tell if it was a lot of fluff um, and maybe a bid by the uh, Trump family to build some hotels in North Korea. Um, <laughs> or if there was something really serious done there. And, and it's just really hard to know exactly what kind of situation Kim Jong-un finds himself in domestically, what has made him agree to these talks, what he, um, he feels that he needs, of course, to stay in power. Um, I don't 
believe in any way, shape, or form that the North Koreans would ever give up their nuclear weapons. And I, I don't think that the Trump administra administration should actually ma be making that the criteria. I mean, I think the criteria is to turn North Korea into a less aggressive, less dangerous nation that has nuclear weapon capability and to make it so that they wouldn't feel the need to threaten Japan or to threaten the United States. And I think that's really should be the US government's primary objective. Um, I, I think because this president is so interested in racking up wins and you know having these achievements that um, he tends to go into these situations too quickly and without a lot of thought to what the real end game should be. Um, however, that isn't to say that this couldn't be a truly dynamic turning point in this relationship. I mean, if the two men have a chemistry, if there is some connection there, if there's a desire to actually get things done, if Kim Jong-un feels very pressured at home to be delivering more food, more economic aid, you know, other changes, then then something could actually happen. Something could come, come of this that I think would be positive. And um, I certainly think that after almost 30 years of American presidents trying to manage North Korea's nuclear aspirations, there's nothing wrong with trying something new. There's nothing wrong with trying something different. Um, meeting with Kim Jong-un gives Kim, Kim Jong-un a lot of propaganda to be used at home, and all of that will, will play out for years, I'm sure. Um, so, some article that I read recently said, you know, it will be the subject of murals and things in North Korea. I'm sure that's true. But um, besides that, I think it's worth exploring whether or not that's a, a way to make a policy change. Jim? Well, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> Always dangerous when a professor says he's going to be brief. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, again, I, I would go back to sort of international relations 101, risk of sounding like a college professor. Um, I think it was in, uh, well, in many, many books, but if you go back and read uh, uh, Henry Kissinger's uh, massive tome on diplomacy, he basically points out that the world of the 21st century is divided into three, three different spheres. Um, I, he, we might have to, he might have to revise this now with the election of Trump, but... Um, uh, you look at the Atlantic world, uh, U.S.-European relations, uh, he and others describe it as post-Westphalian. I don't know how many of you in here have studied uh, the piece of Westphalia, but uh, it's the idea that um, you know, the world is built on uh, two pillars, one sovereignty, sovereignty of the nation state, and the, uh, the principle of non-interference non in the internal affairs of other states. So this is the, basically the nation-state system that evolved from the 17th century. But the idea is that Europe and the U.S. are beyond that, that we were in a new post-national, post-modern phase with built on multilateralism and strong institutions. So that was the transatlantic world. But most importantly... Um, uh, Kissinger and others look at Asia and would say it's still a Westphalian world, you know, where the balance of power is critical. You know, nation states are still the most important players in East Asia. Uh, I don't need to explain this to those of you in the room who've studied international relations. And if you're in a balance of power world, one dominated by, by nation states with strong uh, national interests not restrained by multilateral uh, or institutional arrangements. Uh, you need a balancer in this situation, and the U.S. has been the power that has provided the balance and stability uh, in East Asia. Uh, I, uh, my colleague, Professor Newton, men mentioned the pivot to Asia uh, uh, by President Obama. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in um, Stanford University in the Hoover Institution, and I had a, 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 an interesting meeting with former Secretary of, Schultz, Secretary of State George Schultz, who's 97 years old, I might add. And the pivot to Asia came up, and he had a very interesting comment. He said, yes, we pivoted to Asia, and the Russians invaded Ukraine. <laughs> so... So I think he was right about that. This was a very, very big error, I think, on the part of the Obama administration. 
Um, and of course, the third region of the world is uh, Middle East and Africa, which is pre-Westphalian. You know, the nation state has never taken root there. Uh, it's still a very chaotic conflict region, conflict uh, uh, prone region. So you have these three different regions, but if, if I could go back just a moment to these discussions about Korea that it take place at the Bush uh, Presidential Center at SMU, uh, before we had the round table with Victor Cha and the South Korean official and others, uh, we had a very interesting talk by a North Korean dissident. A uh, very interesting guy. I, actually, I was told that he might be a North Korean with Japanese origins. Uh, I'm not sure if that was correct, but um, that he had some Japanese ancestry. But he made a very interesting comment to me, and you can think about this, or to the group. He said, I think President Trump is the perfect person to deal with President uh, Kim Jong-un. If you think about that for a moment, would that be a compliment? <laughs> or an insult. Um, I think he meant it more in the latter, that these are two people who have a lot of things in common and they may know how to talk to each other and how to deal with each other. But to go back to the round table, just three things, then I will conclude. Victor Cha, who's probably the leading expert on Korea in the United States, whose nomination to be ambassador was withdrawn simply said he could not sit, sit still and listen to the highest American officials um, empowered by Trump talk about a bloody nose for North Korea and a nuclear exchange on the Korean Peninsula. And he spoke up against that, and for that his nomination was withdrawn. So if you believe Professor Cha, we were very close to military conflict on the Korean Peninsula. And he was very frightened by that prospect. Um, the second the Korean official who was there, the South Korean official, very clever what the South Koreans were doing. He, he smiled broadly and he announced that it would be absolutely great if Donald Trump got the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, which <laughs> reveals perfectly the North Korean strategy. Uh, you can flatter this man, you can get him to do things, come to the table, and you have to give the North Korea, South Koreans credit. But, you know, if Trump does withdraw the, uh, the troops and the security guarantee for South Korea and Japan, to go back to Kissinger's point, this will very seriously upset the balance in, in, in East Asia, in my view. And... Um, so I guess those are the things that I wanted to, uh, to bring out in looking at the Korean situation. I think it is a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, the U.S. is still going to have to play a role there. I think the Chinese are, uh, are, are operating very diligently and brilliantly behind the scenes. Uh, but I would say one final thing. Don't forget about Taiwan. <laughs> you know, I think that is a big source of instability and potential conflict. And Trump has already been playing with fire on this issue. Well, yeah. and I would just add that I think um, some people speculate that China is eager to have you know, the North Korean U.S. nuclear summit play out in such a way that the U.S. will reduce forces not so much because they care about North Korea, but because they view that as an opportunity to then take Taiwan by military force. Okay, we are going to uh, over time, like, uh, we'll have like, uh, 10 more minutes or so, uh, so um, I'd like to uh, open uh, the discussion to the floor. Um, who wants to uh, kick off? We've said nothing provocative so far. Mito-sensei. <laughs> uh, the, please wait for the microphone. Thank you very much for very fascinating um, uh, presentations. Um, I'm Tam Mito from the KGU School of Law and Politics. Um, although uh, Jim has mentioned or tried to describe the new world order based on 19th century uh, balance of power system, I think 
Um, it's a totally new system. I, we do have actually the imbalance of power system. The U.S. spends more than half of global military expenditure. We are the only superpower militarily, though, thanks to the balance of terror system of the you know, weapons of mass destruction, we have kind of temporary peace. And however big or small, say, North Korea against U.S., you know, we know the cost of starting war it will um, exceed any gain. You know, as a result, we do have temporary peace. But um, um, I wonder, in this uh, scenario, uh, or in that kind of um, characterization of the international system, it may be easier to um, uh, differentiate different international systems like uh, business, finance, economic, social, etc., etc. And um, possibly what uh, President Trump is trying to do is to say it's a kind of um, a kind of idiosyncratic response to the um, aging problem of the U.S. economy. It can no longer support, you know, the uh, business or uh, economic or trade system on its own. As a result, it's you know um, uh, using kind of there's continuity uh, in the sense that his policies are quite unilateral, um, and I think U.S. Uh, foreign policy tend to be quite unilateral, like Nixon shocks, etc. So it may be, I mean, what he's doing is kind of a um, reaction to the. Uh, aging and, I don't know, uh, weakening of the U.S. Uh, economic hegemony. Well, what uh, do you think? Thanks. Yeah, because since uh, to, uh, three years ago, I remember uh, you took over, uh, you, t you stepped up um, to teach uh, SME in Japan program, uh, the first year uh, Kind of director at the KGU side, uh, directing the SME in Japan program, and I am very. I was very grateful. Uh, at that time, we were kind of struggling with uh, um, finding the uh, faculty member of the KGU who can teach uh, our students. And uh, Mito Sensei stepped up, and then I'm I'm very grateful. And thank you for coming. Um, well, before you know, while thinking about the answer to uh, his question, I'd like to take an, uh, uh, another question, um, Shirato-san. Thank you. Thank you very much for your impressive discussions today. Uh, my name is Shirato. I'm a professor of College of International Relations of Ritsumeikan University in Kyoto. So I'm very happy to join this session today. So, so my question is about the uh, US uh, domestic politics. Uh, I totally agree with you that uh, I don't think China will be able to be the predominant state in the future, the predictable futures. The United States is the only one country as a predominant power in the international liberal orders. So that's why the U.S. president, American president, is the most important leader for the liberal uh, order in the international society. But unfortunately, as you know, the current uh, president is the origin of the chaos, and he, and he is the um, unprecedented president. <laughs> but uh, so my question is, so as long as we are discussing with the high educated peop American people, especially in the university, I uh, don't see the, the expert or scholars who are strongly supporting the, uh, Trump's leaderships. However, he's, he's still keeping uh, more than 40 or 50 percent approval rate you know, in the public opinion poll in the United States. So, so how should we interpret this reality in the United States. So uh, I'm wondering whether he will be re-elected re -elected in the next election in 2020 or something like that. I'm not, sure, I'm not the expert for the American domestic politics, so if you are uh, saying something about this question, so is there any possibility that he will be re-elected in the United States American presidential election in 20, 2020? Thank you. 
Well, that answer, actually, probably the answer to that question about you will hear tomorrow, but I know that you, know, you cannot make it for tomorrow's uh, uh, presentation. So um, before um, uh, answer to uh, Mito Sensei's qu um, question, I would like to pass the microphone to my colleague, uh, Professor Matthew Wilson, who um, kind of led a preview of the, uh, tomorrow's uh, um, uh, discussion. So she has a microphone. I really will be brief because this is not my session, <laughs> but uh, just, no, it's fine. But just, just in response to that, I would say that uh, looking at the sources of President Trump's approval rating, it's important to remember how strong the U.S. economy is right now. Incredibly low unemployment, um, relatively strong GDP growth, certainly compared to what we've had over the last 10 years. Um, a sense that there there is a kind of uh, return of some economic prosperity to the Rust Belt, to some of the uh, areas that have been e economically depressed for some time. And domestic economic prosperity is always going to trump international relations. Trump, no pun intended, but uh, is always going to be more significant than uh, international relations in driving presidential approval. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that you know, Trump's presidential approval is, it's okay now, but it's only okay. It's not as if he's got really strong approval ratings. So there still continues to be significant reservations uh, about him. Uh, but the other thing is, in terms of the international order, um, you know, a lot of us, uh, a lot of people with PhDs can just sort of, you know, sh uh, shake our heads and just say it's how terrible this this trend in, in international relations is and, oh, my goodness, what's happening to the liberal world order and what about the IMF and what about the World Bank and what about the GATT and, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen to these institutions? Ordinary Americans have never heard of those institutions and don't care about them. And to the extent that they have heard about them, they think that they're evil and repressive. Uh, I mean, that's just the reality when you want to be aware of where public opinion is. And by the way, the United States is not unique in that regard. I mean, do surveys of European publics about those institutions and about this whole liberal world order who's, who's you know, crumbling, we're lamenting here. There's a huge disconnect between the way that ordinary citizens look at these institutions and the way that, that uh, global elites, uh, intellectual elites and policy elites uh, look at these institutions. And if, if American leadership is gonna be maintained, and I will stop here, but if American le global leadership is going to be maintained, American leaders, and I mean not just politicians, but, but people like us, scholars, policy analysts, are going to have to make the case to ordinary Americans about what the United States gets out of exercising global leadership, right? That is why it is to the benefit of the American people that the United States be economically and militarily uh, and diplomatically in a position of leadership around the world. Because we've sort of taken that for granted for a long time, and I think a lot of ordinary Americans are starting to say, what benefits are there that, that merit the costs that are associated with exercising global leadership? So I think there really is an educational task that has to be performed there. Okay, um, so you want to go to, okay, so first uh, Diana and then uh, Jim. So no, 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 I would say that I completely agree with everything that Matt said and um, his panel tomorrow is gonna be excellent. Um, I think that there's a very, very good chance that Trump will be reelected um, because I think that economically the United States is doing really, really well right now. And I think that there is a deep desire among Americans, many Americans, not those of us in this room, but to see him continue to upend the system, to push on it because it isn't benefiting many average Americans. And that, the reason I wanted to go first is because I just want to segue quickly into your question, which I think is connected, which I, I think that one of the things that made democracy so appealing from the end of the Cold uh, World War II until recently was that along with liberal democracy and these institutions came this huge economic engine that made people's lives better, and so that was very appealing. But now that some of these systems in our aging democracies are no longer necessarily making people's lives better. There's a real hankering for something different, and that can even be 
a nationalist government, a strong man government, maybe that person's going to bring me a better life because what's going on right now is not to my advantage. And so I think that that's where Trump has really found this very sensitive spot and he's pushing on it and people are responding. Well, um, I'd like to uh, uh, say one word, uh, and word that uh, before um, moving, uh, you know, um, Jim will uh, conclude. One thing that I, I always um, say and think uh, when evaluating Trump and his support uh, is that Trump is not responding to strategy. And we tend to uh, make a mistake that uh, you know, every politician should have strategy, and mostly they have. But uh, Trump is not. Trump is basically responding to psychology. So uh, when we think about uh, Trump's policy, and it's not consistent, it's unpredictable, it's, uh, it's unpredictable, yes, if you take Trump and Trump policies as a psychology, then uh, it makes much more sense. And uh, having said that, I'm not sure, and then I hope the Trump re-election re will, uh, will not happen. But um, yeah, but I can agree with you. <laughs> so, Jim. Well, I, I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, but I, but I do think you, um, uh, you put your finger on it. I think your, your uh, assessment of the situation is, is a very accurate one. Um, and um, this is a, a symptom of the decline of American power. And, uh, you know, uh, Americans feel this very acutely. Um, and, you know, what an irony that you know, the American economy is so strong, which it is in many respects. Uh, the global economy is doing quite well. You know, markets, although they've been somewhat flat this year, but, you know, we've had a long period of peace and prosperity. Um, but we are in, you know, a state of psychological crisis, you know, that something terrible has happened. And um, I think Trump has, you know, Professor Wilson is correct. I mean, he's tapped into the zeitgeist, to use a, a good German term. He certainly has understood uh, that many Americans uh, feel abandoned. They feel left out of this prosperity. Uh, and, you know, he has played the role of, you know, uh, so I, you know again, I keep going back to my my roots in French history and French politics, you know, he's, he's taken a sort of Bonapartist line here that, you know, I am the savior, I'm the one who can come in and rectify this situation. Um, so I think he has tapped into the zeitgeist. Uh, will he be reelected? I think I will leave that to the, to my colleagues in American politics, who I have to say did not predict his election in the first place, but uh, so the track record here is, is not, not stellar. Uh, and maybe to the odds makers in Las Vegas, um, uh, maybe they will have, uh, you know, give you some odds on this. But um, uh, so I'm not sure, you know, I think it was Harold Macmillan, the famous Tory prime minister in Britain, and someone asked him, Prime Minister Macmillan, what worries you most? You remember this quote? And he said, events, my dear boy, events. So what Trump is doing probably may not matter at all until it does. <laughs> uh, so maybe that's a good note on which to conclude. Okay, I think that uh, this topic um, we can talk uh, endlessly, uh, but uh, we have um, time uh, coming, and the very, uh, so tomorrow um, our discussion uh, continues. Uh, we still have um, a lot of um, rooms um, for, so, uh, uh, for, um, for, for the seats. So um, uh, if you haven't uh, registered, um, please come still, and uh, you will still ha also have a, a lunch, a lunch box. Uh, during the lunchtime, uh, we will have a keynote speaker uh, by a keynote speech uh, by uh, Professor Shinyo, um, 
who was a vice president, uh, former vice president of uh, KGU and also a professor uh, of KGU and also a former ambassador to Germany. He will give a, a keynote speech uh, yes, uh, tomorrow, and then we'll have three panels. Um, before closing, I would like to uh, acknowledge another staff member who, uh, who, we, uh, who is working uh, for this symposium uh, to happen. And then also, I would call the best ambassador of KGU to SMU, Marito Isozaki. Um, she was a staff member of uh, SMU Tower Center from tw uh, 2012 to 2014, and then she's now back to uh, KGU as a staff member of KGU. So she is probably the only person who has uh, done the, uh, who has uh, been the staff of both uh, SMU and KGU, and uh, we are very grateful uh, of your contribution uh, to the SMU Tower Center. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, we will adjourn. So tomorrow's site is also here, so uh, we will, uh, uh, we will uh, resume the discussion here. <laughs>